Hey class, it's Bill Berry with another demo for week three in this case, and we are adding a lot of new knowledge this week, and we are also adding a lot of new functionality, so this video will probably be broken into several pieces uh, because we have a lot to cover and a lot of interesting stuff, and now that we have both uh, selection control structures and indefinite loops, we have a lot of stuff that we can do, so we have a lot, lot to cover. Let's jump in and get going and look at what we're going to do this week. So this week's demo, let's create a menu-based program that does temperature conversions. There's a nice website uh, in Wikipedia that we're talking about, and it gives the various kinds of temperature conversions and what exactly you need to do to do the math. And another thing that I like here is it gives a table with some comparisons, so there's some great test data for us there. So let's do that, and we're going to display a menu that lets them convert. We're going to make sure the menu guards against both range errors, so choosing an option that is a valid data type but outside a range, and we'll also guard against bad data types, which is something new for us. We will, of course, create functions for each conversion. Uh, there's a method to my madness there, but uh, that makes sense. And we'll make sure that those functions don't allow any kind of invalid arguments. So, for instance, Kelvin, there's nothing that's a negative Kelvin value that's valid, so we'll want to guard against that. And then I may do a bonus video on testing, doing unit testing on these conversion functions. We really need to get used to the fact that when we write functions, when we write objects, we need to write testing code along with that. We always want to do that. In fact, uh, some would argue we write the testing code first, but uh, hey, let's, uh, you know, we'll worry about that in another video at the end as a bonus feature. So let's jump in and see what we're going to do there. And let's, uh, I've started a simple program here and I have only the, you know, the basic stuff. I've created one class called temps. I've created a basic class here and put in the, the general stuff that we always do. And I've created a main which should make sense by now and you should recognize the format for that by now so I won't bother with all of that. So let's start with the easy part and that's creating the functions that are going to do all the temperature conversion. So let me paste those in. Actually before I do that let me show you the Java docs, an easy way to do this thing so that you get all the parameters. So let me show you how to do one and then I'll come back and paste those things in. If you press Control M which you'll see there's going to be an option to do this. To insert a method, you can do Control M, and I like this because when you do it, it provides a great header for you. So for instance, if I was going to do uh, converting Fahrenheit to, you know, what the, whatever the first one's going to be, let's say Fahrenheit to Celsius, I can come in here and say converts Fahrenheit, you got to be German to spell that right, I guess, uh, Celsius. And then this is important stuff because, as I'll show you in a minute, this creates the basis for our Java docs. So parameter, for instance, I'm going to pass in degrees Fahrenheit, and that's going to be, uh, that's going to be degrees Fahrenheit. And what does it return? It passes back degrees Celsius. So the interesting thing, let me go ahead and do this real quick, just so you can see the full output double. I'm going to use floating point numbers here, and I'm going to call this F2C, and I'm going to pass in a double representing degrees F. Now let me show you here, uh, just for fun, I'll make sure it compiles, and then, cool. Uh, now notice that if I now go to the documentation view, Notice that we've got the method summary, and it's really cool because the documentation is all very good now. So you'll notice that we have this summary up here, tells you the data types, gives you the, the basic stuff, and then down here it gives you a, a much more detailed view of the thing. And you get all of that for free if you do the right kinds of headers. So I really recommend that when you put in a new function, instead of just typing in you know, your own, use control M and get used to filling these things out. I'll want to see that and I'll want to review your documentation and this is a great practice uh, for the future when it makes it so easy to generate the documentation you've got to use it. Notice that you want to put a couple of spaces here uh, because it, that's how it knows that you're going to separate in this case the different fields which is this thing which tells you it's a parameter coming the name of the parameter and the description for it so you'll want to do that. So let me now paste in these functions and we'll go forward from there. 
So what you'll notice here is that all these functions have bodies now, and they're fairly simple. We just take the formulas that are given to us on the website, or you know, verify them uh, however you want to do it, but you can take those formulas and pretty easily turn these into uh, single lines that you just return the calculated thing. So it's really not too exciting to do that. It's not too hard. Now the only thing that we want to talk about here is we want to talk a little bit about preconditions. Notice that if we get some bad data in, uh, for instance the Kelvin to Fahrenheit, if the user gives us a negative Kelvin value, we might have a sort of agreement and contract that says, hey, you know, bef you guys outside of us, we don't deal with the user at all. You guys need to make sure that we don't get bad input passed into us. And uh, the, the contract says, look, don't give us negative values because Kelvin's not going to be calculated correctly if you do that, or the, the resulting uh, temperature conversion. So one of the things that this represents is a precondition. And one of the typical ways to do that, because notice we're returning a double. We don't really have any good way to signal them that something really wrong happened. We could have a secret value, like, you know, we say, well, we're going to pass you back negative 99. But secret values are tough when you're using floating point numbers because a lot of times those values could be real actual temperatures. So we don't have any good way a lot of times to do this except by throwing an exception. And an exception would let us say, hey, something really bad happened and we want to refuse that data. The calling program should have known better than to pass us this stuff. So one way to do that is with throwing exceptions. This is a precondition as your text talks about. And it looks something like this. We say if and then we make an if statement, which, as you have read, always requires parentheses. And we can say, look, if degrees Kelvin is less than zero, then, and the, what we want to do in this case is we want to throw an exception. We use the throw keyword, and then we need to, th we need to basically pass throw or, or provide an object, an, an exception object. And so what we need to do there is we say throw, and then we give the object, which is a new, and this is the typical one you throw, illegal argument exception. And then you can optionally pass it a little message. So for instance, Kelvin degrees must be non-negative. Right? And then that's the end of this. Now, we don't really need to put an else here. It seems like it. We might want to say else return, but you don't have to because if you throw an exception, you're done anyway, right? You're jumping out and the calling program is going to get notified. So you really don't need an else, but your eye has to know that. You have to know that when you read it that the else isn't really required here. Just like if you had a return statement in here, right? If you're returning some value, you don't need to have an else. It's, it's done, right, after return. So what's going to happen now is if I try to do this, if I try to call it, I'm going to get that exception thrown. So we can do an example. Notice we added this in the K2F. So if I come into main and I say system.out.println and I try to say Kelvin to Fahrenheit and then I'm going to try to call it. So I'm going to call k 2 F and I'm going to pass it a negative 3.0. Close, close. I'm going to compile that. I don't have any errors. I'll come back to this guy and I'll run it and we'll see what happens. Right? And you'll see that we basically got, if we look at our output, we got a, an, a legal argument exception as you'd expect. All right? Now, that means the calling program has to go handle that, but that's okay. We expect it to, right? So that's, uh, that's exactly what we do here. So that is a little quick look at preconditions, and I'm going to do the same thing in both of these. I'm going to copy and paste this because this is going to be useful in this one as well. <clears throat> so I will paste that guy there. So that's a quick introduction to preconditions, how you can use an if statement and a throw to, to throw the exception of interest. And that one very often is an illegal argument exception. And notice that didn't require any imports or anything. It just worked like that. So that's a quick introduction to getting this thing set up, getting the functions set up, and then also doing the preconditions. And that uses an if. And of course, if requires the parentheses around well, the, the test. And then in brackets, you put, uh, you know, in curly braces, you put this thing. Now, I want to uh, give you 
uh, one quick little piece of information. I don't want you to use this in your programs, but I want you to see that this is that this is something that is possible. And that is the if statement uh, will will run if the thing is true, if the condition is true, it will do the next statement or since we have curly braces, the next block which is controlled by the curly brace. I just want you to see really quickly that this is completely valid. right? This is same in C, same in Java. You can do this which says if this happens, throw this. And the if statement will only affect the next statement. Right? So this is also valid. This is the same thing. But the reason that we don't use that in code is because of this. Which thing is controlled by the if? This is not Python. Right? So what is controlled by the if? Really only this one statement. Why? Because we don't have the curly braces and if by default only affects one statement. So there are cases where we may want to use that other form, but in general, we don't want to use that form. We always want to use the form that requires all of the parentheses, right? all of the curly braces, so that we get something that is obviously true. And we know that if we add something inside the curly braces, it's part of the if. And if we don't, if we add them outside, it's not part of the if. So I uh, just wanted to give you that quick little piece uh, of information about the if, and we may use that to our advantage in some later day. But this is our uh, start to our program. We have all the functions in place, and we've talked about preconditions. So I'll stop the video here, and we'll continue on the next video.